All right, I'm going to continue with our series on critical race theory and the Christian response or solution. And tonight I want to talk about the problem of prejudice. The problem of prejudice. You know, many Americans are finally waking up and wondering what's happening to our country. Maybe you're one of those. And the truth is the church has been asleep, I think much like the sleeping farmer in Jesus' parable of the tares in Matthew 13, where he said, while men slept, an enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And one of the tares I believe the enemy has sown in our country has been this critical race theory uh, ideology. And I'll just say up front, as I have been saying, critical race theory is one of what I believe Paul was referring to in uh, Ephesians when he said expose the unfruitful works of darkness. It is an unfruitful work of darkness, an ideology that is polluting our institutions, poisoning our children, and bringing America to the brink of something like a race war. And it's invading our schools, uh, our major corporations, and of course, the mainstream media who are not our friends, by the way. And it's tearing the fabric of our nation. I don't believe Vody Bauckham was exaggerating when he said that families are already being torn apart. Churches and denominations are being split over this. You know, I don't know, we stay up on the news uh, and sometimes it feels overwhelming. I was reminded of the scripture uh, in Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy comes in like a flood, <clears throat> that's the bad news. But the good news is the rest of the verse. Uh, the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And uh, the psalmist tells us what standard I believe he's referring to in Psalm 60, verse 4. You have given a banner of truth to those who fear you that it may be displayed because of the truth. How many of you know, as we've said, this is an hour to live not by lies. This is an hour to speak the truth in every way that we can. And here's the truth. The Christian solution or cure for the evils of critical race theory and those who seek to divide and conquer America can only come from Christians who know how to deal with the problem of prejudice in all its forms. Now, some of you say, well, I thought we were gonna talk about racism. The root of racism is prejudice. You know, you don't hear the term prejudice much anymore, but back in our day, racial prejudice was the term. Today, it's more fashionable to use racism, but I wanna to talk to you and I wanna lay an ax to the root of something that I believe if we're going to help other people, we've got to be helped first ourselves. So this is a somewhat of a more personal pastoral message on the problem of prejudice. What is it? It's a compound word, pre and judge, judgment. That's where it comes from, pre-judgment. It's, it's a pre-judgment of a person or a thing. The definition in the dictionary, it is an unfavorable opinion of or feeling formed beforehand, especially of a hostile nature regarding an ethnic racial, social, or religious group. It's having a preset idea about others based on assumptions and preconceptions rather than their actions or their character. Now, prejudice is a problem that we often fail to see even in ourselves because it functions at somewhat of a subconscious level. And I'm, I've been praying all week, the Holy Spirit would, would, would reveal to each one of us tonight an air, this area of, of potential problem so that we can, we can deal with it. Uh, and it function, it's, 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 it's not only subconscious level, but it functions in many forms. There are uh, a number of different kinds of prejudice. So years ago, someone taught on this and I never forgot it. So I knew it must've been the Holy Spirit because it's been 
probably 40 years ago when I heard this taught that there are many kinds of prejudice. I never really thought about it. Usually you think of racial prejudice and that's what big one, but there is chronological prejudice, which is on the basis of age. That's the age old conflict between the generations, uh, rebellion and young people. How many know some young people just don't like older people? Okay. Uh, there's geographical prejudice uh, that's on the basis of where people live or where they come from. I mean, when we were uh, raised in the deep south, you know, we didn't like Yankees. They said, well, them Yankees are just different than us. Haven't you ever heard anything like that? I, I mean, if you're from the south, I'm sure you've, you've heard the term referring to people who are from mm, the north. And so when you meet someone who's from the north, you know, there, there may be something operating in you that says, uh-oh, uh, I don't think this person's going to be friendly or whatever. Whatever preconception, how many of you see what I'm trying to get at? It's, it's just a prejudgment. Uh, there is gender prejudice on the basis of male and female. Uh, some men actually see women as lesser than men. Now, I pray that's not true. And I know you're not married to Elizabeth. If, but how many of you know there are, there are men who actually see women as lesser or in a way that uh, is inferior? And so uh, when they deal with women, they have a way that's rooted in prejudice. And then, of course, there are on the other side... I mean, some men only see women as fit for being a housewife, for example. They don't like women. They're resentful of women in the workforce, whatever. And then, of course, we've ministered to women who say all men are creeps. As a matter of fact, I'm married to one of those people. That But uh, I'm just trying to say that, that, that prejudice comes in many forms. It's subconscious. Sometimes it can be innocent. We're not really aware of it. And then, of course, there's uh, class or economic prejudice. Now, this is on the basis of social standing or standard of living. Uh, it could be prejudice according to uh, how a person is clothed. Uh, others look down on common laborers. On the other end, there's people who just resent the wealthy. Uh, they just suspect you of not being honest or upright if you have a lot of money. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the one that's on the front page, and that is racial prejudice. The problem of judging, prejudging others on the basis of skin color or nationality. Now, the truth is, and we pointed this out last week, if you weren't here last week, I really encourage you to get that. I did a lot of research on that. I just took six or seven of the key spokespeople for the ideology of critical race theory so that you could hear from their own words uh, how racist they really are. Uh, they accuse uh, all white people of being automatically racist because they're white, but when you read their books or look at their websites, uh, their newsletters, it's very obvious they are absolutely racist and racially prejudiced. I'll give you one tonight. Kate Slater, who's the assistant dean at Brandeis University, yes, all white people are racist in that all white people have been conditioned in a society where one's racial identity determines life experiences and outcomes. And whiteness is the norm and the default. Now she is white. She says, that includes me. I don't hate white people, I hate whiteness. So in other words, when this, and why would you send, why would you pay $80,000 to send your kids to this school to learn this crap? That is a mystery. But the point is that, I mean, what's going on here? Uh, there's a prejudgment going on. When 
Kate Slater meets uh, a white person. She's already prejudged that person on the basis of critical race theory. But folks, I'm telling you, it's a house of cards. It will not stand. You can count on that. It's built on a lie that people are born prejudiced. And that is absolutely not true. Chuck Swindoll said many years ago, prejudice is a learned trait. You are not born prejudiced, you are taught it. No one is born racist. If you're a racist, someone taught it to you. No one is born a critical race theorist either. Someone taught it to them. The same principle applies to prejudice in all its forms, but God's word has a cure for it, and we, it is the Christian solution. Now, the thing to remember is that all forms of prejudice are prejudgment of others on the basis of what the New Testament refers to as the flesh. That's a key scripture. I, now, I know I keep repeating it, but one of the primary ways of teaching to teach someone is to repeat. And that scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, Paul says, therefore, from now on, we regard or judge no one according to the flesh. Now, I'll give you a little point, and I've missed, I've read this hundreds of times, but I missed a little something that I think was a nugget. And it was the phrase, from now on. Paul says, therefore, from now on, we judge no one according to the flesh. Now, if someone says, from now on, and they indicate a behavior, they're basically admitting up to now, it's been different. You see that? I mean, he might have said up to now, I've regarded others according to the flesh, but from now on, the context proves, read the preceding verses, it won't take time. He's talking about his conversion to Christ. He's talking about becoming a Christian. The Greek word means we behold, we, we regard or behold or consider or judge no one according to the flesh from now on. He's saying, in other words, after he became a believer, he made a decision about how he would judge other people. I, Holy Spirit, help me. You see, becoming a Christian does not automatically deliver you from prejudice. This is something that happened after he became a Christian. He made a decision. And I believe this is, this is I wrote this down. I, I, I'm not saying God dictated it to me, but I believe it's pretty good. Every born again believer must make a from now on decision to regard, consider, or judge, or prejudge, no one according to the flesh. Now this message tonight, I believe, is intended to be somewhat of a wake-up call because sometimes when we're battling something that's so obviously evil, we can miss it in ourselves. Little things that we were taught or the way we look at others and so I think with God's help tonight, I mean, I wanna, I wanna clear the decks. Uh, I remember the civil rights struggles of the 1960s. By that time I was uh, an adult and I remember very clearly the pictures, the images uh, in black and white on TV nightly about some of the the conflicts in our cities. I remember the fire hoses and the police dogs, and uh, it, was, it was so ugly. And, and, and during that time, God raised up a Christian minister named Martin Luther King, and I believe he was God's man to wake the nation. I mean, he, God used him at a time when there was turmoil even worse than what we've seen so far today. What we're seeing today is getting close. But uh, that's when God raises up 
these voices as wake up calls. And I will say this, I believe that man woke America in a good way. I mean, I believe up until that time, there were, there's always a few radical, there's always a few racists here and there, but I don't believe the average white person even then was racist. But I want to tell you when that happened and he made his famous, I have a dream speech, it really woke up a lot of white people. Hey, we got a problem here and it's not good and we need to fix it. And I believe in a way they examine their own hearts and said, well, is this in me? You remember his famous line, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation, listen to his words, where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Isn't that nothing but a paraphrase of what Paul said? Therefore, we regard or judge no one according to the flesh, no one according to uh, their skin color. Uh, I believe that maybe he didn't have that text in mind when he gave the speech, but I believe it was a modernized version of what Paul was saying. He dreamed of a nation where no one would judge or prejudge another person on a basis of a flesh issue, like the color of their skin. And many in that day had a from now on moment, and God wants uh, that for us. Now, if you want to know a little more detail about what he meant over in Philippians 3, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the Apostle Paul himself admitted that Christ had delivered him from his former prejudice of how he had formerly judged himself as superior to others. Uh, quickly, Philippians 3, 3 and 4, he's talking to the church. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I was even more so. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Do you see what he's saying? He said, I was prejudiced. Uh, I was even judging myself according to the flesh. I was doing this, doing that. I was born Jewish. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. The Pharisees were considered the hoi polloi, spiritually speaking. And he was a teacher of, of, of the other Pharisees. So he had all of these credentials, but he says, in Christ, I count them all nothing but loss. So this is what he was referring to. Now, Jesus, I believe he got a revelation of what Jesus said in John 6, 63. He says, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The flesh profits nothing. So to sum it up, all the evils of racism and prejudice have one thing at the root, and it is judging others after the flesh. And it is not a new problem for God's people. And if you'll indulge me, I believe... I want to show you some scriptures. I'm going to look at a lot of scriptures because I want to, you to walk out of here tonight seeing this is not a new problem for the church. It's not like, oh, we've never seen anything like this before. Who's ever? Beloved, this was the problem in the early church. And I'll show you this from, uh, first of all, the ministry of Jesus. Now, many of the Jews of Jesus' day, especially the Pharisees, were actually what I would term a race, racist. Why? Because they judged themselves as superior. The Jews of Jesus' day, if you really look at it, especially those in religious leadership, judged themselves superior to the other nations. 
on the basis of the flesh, meaning we can trace our lineage back to Abraham and others can't do that. And so they saw themselves. Actually, they, uh, if you really want to study this out, you can read Edersheim or many of the, the, the scholars who check this out. I mean, the Jews looked down so much on the other nations, they call them dogs. They saw anyone who was not Jewish as not only the uncircumcision, which is really a term that means they have no covenant with God, but it was even more demeaning. That was why Jesus told the little Gentile woman, you know, when she asked for healing, he said, is it right to give the dogs the children's bread? And he was testing her to see if she was going to be offended. But she didn't argue that she was a dog in his sight because she knew she was not Jewish. Hello? Okay. And uh, the, the, I mean, I could give you several examples, but I'm going to go with the, the exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees in the debate in John chapter 8. Now we taught on verse 32 for weeks, uh, you shall know the truth. Jesus said to his disciples, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Well, this is what happens next, verse 33. And they answered him and said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone, which was a lie. They were in Egypt, Egyptian bondage. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus says, verse 37 to 39, I know you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father and you do what you've seen with your father. Verse 41, they answered and said, Abraham is our father. In verses 42 to 44, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why don't you understand my speech? It is because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. Not very politically correct, might add. I mean, you see what's going on here. Do you see this? They judge themselves as superior and others as inferior. And when Jesus comes and talks to them about their problem, all they can do is refer to the flesh. Jesus is basically saying, if, if you were really God's people, you would listen to me, but you don't listen. So in other words, all of their fleshly credentials counted for nothing. It's very important, very important. The point of the passage is these Pharisees were very prejudiced on how they saw others. Now, I can also, I started to talk about the woman at the well. Remember when Jesus was at the well and the Samaritan woman, the Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans to them were downright uh, degraded. And that's why when he came, when he spoke to her at the well, she said, why, how are you speaking to me? Uh, you, 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 uh, you, you, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Why do you think she said that? Because there was prejudice in the Jews toward the Samaritans. But I left that out because I'm sparing you some. Not much, but I'm sparing you a little. That racial issues continued after resurrection. Uh, the greatest enemies of the gospel were the Jews. At Antioch, Acts chapter 13, 44 and 45. On the next Sabbath, about almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, opposing the things spoken of by Paul. Now here's Paul, he's preaching the gospel. How many of you know it's good news? But the, this group of Jews were, were blaspheming and shouting him down because they were filled with envy. What was the envy? Well, if you look at the Bible scholars, and again, I'm sparing you, I'm not going to give you death by PowerPoint tonight, I hope. But if you really studied out really what it was, 
the Jews resented the fact that the gospel was for everyone. And I could show you that over and over. You see, the Jews had been conditioned, and they are God's chosen people. Let's face it, out of all the nations of the earth, I'm not putting down the Jews as a people. God knows we wouldn't have the Bible if it wasn't for the Jews. Hello? But I'm just trying to show you how prejudice was, was working in that in a, a group of people against the gospel, even back in those days. Same thing happened at Corinth, Acts 18, 15, uh, 18, 5 and 6. So when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your heads. I am clean from now on. I will go to the Gentiles. So it was the same problem. I mean, and again, I could go back and show you in the ministry of Jesus, the same thing happened. Uh, when, he, when he was preaching, whosoever will may come. You know, whosoever. He had a lot of whosoevers. This was offensive to these people who had been for centuries taught that they, they, beyond the fact that they were God's chosen people. But see, that even that wasn't on the basis of the flesh. Stay with me, folks. Then in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 to 16, Paul is writing to the church. For you, brethren, also suffered some things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans or the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men. Why? Because they forbid us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as to always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. So the problem there again is prejudice. I hope, you, are you getting this? Do this a little bit so I can think. I don't wanna keep dwelling on it if you got it. You got it? Four people have it. You're not very reassuring. I'm trying, okay. They are contrary to us, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. It was a racial issue. It was a racial issue. Now, all of these examples uh, show us that prejudice was working in this group. Now, on the other hand, the multitudes of Jews who did receive Christ, but even some of them continue to struggle with the problem of prejudice, even after some of the Jews became Christians. We see this. Uh, in the situation that happened in the Galatian churches. You had uh, Jews who had become Christians, but they went through the churches of Galatia preaching what? They basically were saying, you're not a real Christian or a full Christian until you've been circumcised. Okay. Or follow our customs. This is why Paul wrote in verses 26 to 28, for you to the church, for you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. That's another way of saying Jew or Gentile. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus, and if you're Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. David French comments, says, at one stroke, Paul sweeps away race, class, and sex as controlling identities. It's not that you're a Greek Christian, it's that you're Christian. Our identity rests in Christ and in him alone. Can I have an amen? This is what he was dealing with and this is how he dealt with it. And if the church is going to speak to the problem of critical race theory and racism in our country, 
We got to get some things right in our mind so that what we're doing is based on scripture and not emotion or even on logic. It's based on scripture. Paul ran into the same issue in Rome where he had to deal with racism to the Romans because some were teaching that Jewish Christians were superior to Gentile Christians. And it's amazing that some even believe that today, I have to say. That's why Paul said this amazing uh, passage in Romans 10, 11 to 13. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction, no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is uh, over all is rich to all who call upon him all who call upon him for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, it's really, it's really something bad teaching beloved is, is bad teaching. And it's like leaven and it can get into a, a church, get into a Christian's mind and it, it needs to be corrected. And this is what Paul is doing here. The Jews, and I hope nobody's hearing me wrong here. I'm just saying, if you, we're, we're dealing with the problem of prejudice, uh, racism, we're dealing with the idea of superiority over another group of people. And uh, that's why I say the Jews of Jesus' day, some of the Jews of Jesus' day were like the white supremacists of our day. They saw themselves superior on the basis of race or the flesh. Even some of the Jews who became Christians continued to boast themselves over those who were not circumcised. What did Paul respond to? In Romans 2, 28, 29, and I preached this, I got into trouble for this. I'll probably get in trouble for it again. I, I, I can't help it. It's, this is the scripture. If you have a problem, by the way, if there's ever anything that I'm teaching that you would question or even want to debate, I am at your disposal. There's nothing that makes me uh, more uncomfortable than for you to sit there and just listen to me teach something that you really disagree with or have scripture to contradict. I really need to talk to you. I don't want you to not feel free to question or ask about anything that we're teaching. But I said years ago, I said, when uh, Paul's solution to racism regarding the Jews and the Gentiles, he just redefined the Jew. No one had ever said what Paul says in these two verses. He says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly whose circumcision is that of the spirit in the, in, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now he just, no one's ever wrote, written anything like this. He just says, he says, look guys, let, let's get this straight. <laughs> you are not a Jew because of the flesh. You are not a Jew uh, if your circumcision is only an outward thing of the flesh. But you are a Jew if you are inwardly circumcised of the heart. How many of you see the difference between the flesh and the character? Don't judge according to the flesh, the color of the skin or the nationality, judge according to the heart. And this is exactly what it says. The message was called the Jew is you. And I preached it to the church and some people went like, you know, that's why I, and I listen, I've done this for years. And again, I've talked to some people about it. I've had some people accuse me of some things that aren't true. I'm just telling you, this is what he says. And it's very plain. That's why when I meet a Jew and they say, I'm Jewish, I say, so am I. <laughs> and they go, <laughs> I don't think you're a Jewish. I said, according to, the New, according to the New Testament, I am. According to God's word, I am. Let me show you that. And let me tell you something. This is the way you can reach some Jews, perhaps, because they th think they're right with God because they're Jewish. 
Okay. Well, in closing, no, I'm not closing. That was supposed to be funny. All right. Later in Romans 9, 6, and 7, Paul says another thing. He says, not all Israel is Israel. Now, what does that mean? Not all Israel is Israel. He meant that not all Jews are really Jews in God's definition, meaning people of God. Not all Israel is the true Israel in the same way that not everyone in the church is a Christian. The great Matthew Henry commented on this verse. He said, this is like Christianity. He is not a Christian who is one outwardly, nor is that baptism which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Christian who is one inwardly, and the baptism is of the heart, in the spirit, and not the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Is this helping anybody? Okay, I'm not expecting a whole bunch of amen. Sometimes when people have new material, you know, I don't want a bunch of parrots out there. Amen, Brother Ray. Brother Ray said it must be right. He must be right. And he's always right. Who am I to question him? Well, you better check out everything that I preach or anybody else preaches. Okay, is that a deal? All right. Paul wasn't the only apostle who had to deal with the problem of prejudice in himself. Before God could send Simon Peter to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, he had to visit him three times with a vision. Now again, I'm sparing you all the scriptures, but basically Peter is staying at a certain house and he has this vision. And there's a sheet that comes down from heaven and inside are all kinds of animals, food animals. But some were clean and some were unclean according to the law. And then God said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, I have never eaten anything unclean and or common. And he does that three times. And finally, God says to him, don't call common what I call clean. And then Peter's going like, what does that mean? And then he gets the messenger from the house of the Gentile who says, my master, who is an Italian in the Roman Legion, wants you to come to his house. Now, how many of you see what God was doing? God was dealing with Peter's inner prejudice against Gentiles. And he set him up with a vision, giving him a revelation that when God calls something clean, don't you call it unclean. Don't you, don't you judge wrongly. That's why when Peter arrives at the house of Cornelius in Acts 10, no, when he, excuse me, when Peter arrives in, in Acts 10, 28, he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Do you ever notice that verse before? Peter was raised with a prejudice. He said, Jewish, Jewish people don't go to the house of another nation, someone from another nation, another nationality, another people group. A few verses later, the whole family gets saved. And Cornelius falls at Peter's feet and wants to worship him. But Peter says, hey, I'm just a man. And then in verses 34, 35, Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Isn't that beautiful? That's a, that's a great story. We could do a whole sermon on Acts chapter 10 on the, on the subject. I'm just trying to show you how Jesus dealt with prejudice. Peter, Paul dealt with prejudice. Peter dealt with prejudice. I mean, this is right on through the, but we, we miss it 
Why do we miss it? Because we think race or prejudice is racial, but it's, it's actually black and white. But see, in their day, it was Jew and Gentile. Okay. You'll probably have to listen to this again. I don't know. God help you. The only permanent solution to what's facing us is in the church, is in the gospel message. We have the answer. You see, my fear is that we're, you know, that we, we get into thinking after the flesh ourselves and think that we're going to solve the problem by passing laws. I was around when they said, well, we, we, it's not good that blacks and whites, you know, go to different schools. We want integration. And they forced it. They f had forced integration. They had the busing laws to where your kids could be three blocks from their school, but because the government wanted equality, your kid had to be bused all the way across town to another school so that we could have racial integration. That is the stupidest. And brother, Americans didn't like it. They didn't like it then, they won't like it now. So we're not going to see a legislative solution. It's got to come by the spirit. These are actually, Christians know that all of this stuff is in people because we're sinful people. It's just an expression of our sinful nature. But when we come to Christ, we need to have from now on moment where we say, okay, I see this and it's not going to be in me. We need to be born again. We need to see ourselves and others as God sees. How does God see? First Samuel chapter 16, verse seven, the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. <clears throat> Got it? So in, we, when, we, when we make our minds up as Christians, we're not going to judge after the flesh. And it's going, it, it, it may not come automatically easy. It may be something you realize, oh boy, I, I, I didn't know I saw that. I see it now. There's no, there's no Jew or Greek. I can't, I can't have chronological prejudice, gender prejudice, prejudice, nationality prejudice, color of skin prejudice. David French says, to state this fundamental uh, spiritual truth is not to deny that a broken, sinful world, including an often broken, sinful church, persists in wrongly elevating race, gender, or class, and often making those identities primary and central to their perception of others. But the role of the church is to oppose that false construct. All human beings are defined most principally by the shared reality that they're made in the image of God and all Christians are defined by Christ. And another thought, if we can simplify all this, it's as simple as the golden rule. In Matthew 7, 12, Jesus said it in just a few words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How many of you do not want to be judged according to your skin color or your age or your gender? I mean, it, it would be terrible, wouldn't it? If, if, if I meet a person and they've got an inner prejudice against males or older males or handsome males, uh, you know, who would want that? Who, who would want to, because your clothes aren't the designer brand, who would want to, to be seen by other people as inferior because you, you don't have the right logo on your shirt pocket or whatever it is? I don't want that. Well, then I must not do that to others. I, I cannot live that way. If I'm going to be a Christian, I have to do unto others as I would have them to do unto me. And that 
is a golden rule for sure. There is a place for judgment. I'll leave you with this thought and then we'll close in prayer. Uh, you know, we're talking about prejudging judgment, uh, how we see others. It, it does not mean that, you know, the one you'll hear sometimes from, from opponents, you Christians, Jesus said, judge not. And they don't even quote the rest of the verse that you be not judged, but they just said, judge not. And, you know, that is a complete corruption of what Jesus was saying and even the context of the passage. When he was talking in Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged, he was talking about condemning others as if you were God and you can judge another person's character. He didn't mean judge not never. You can't live your life without making judgments. As a matter of fact, a few verses later, he said, beware of false prophets. Well, now how are you going to be aware of a false prophet unless you judge someone to be one? He said, don't cast your pearls. And a few verses later, he says, don't cast your pearls before swine. Well, how do you, how, how do you uh, not cast your pearls before swine unless you can judge who's a swine? So I'm just trying to say, don't let people, don't let people throw you some kind of a stupid argument. You need to be on your game. Jesus said it another way in John 7, 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Notice, do not judge according to appearance, but do judge righteous judgment. Righteous judgment is after the spirit, according to the word. Can I have an amen? Father, I'm asking you tonight, Lord, as we prepare to engage the enemy on the subject of critical race theory, that our own house will be clean, that we will be delivered our own selves and our own minds from any prejudice of any kind in any of its forms. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and, 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 and speak to us, reveal to us, convict us of any area of our lives where we were trained or have been experienced in functioning in a prejudging situation toward other people, anything after the flesh, because Lord, we want to engage the enemy on this key issue. We want to speak the word of truth. We want to raise up the standard of truth as the enemy tries to come in like a flood. And we ask you, Lord, that we would be clean vessels that we would be fit for the master's use regarding the problem of prejudice in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen. amen.